President Mamadou Buhari returns to Nigeria after spending more than three months in Britain for medical treatment. Eclipse fever fuels demand for special viewing lenses across the United States. And no, you're not seeing things. Yes, those dogs really are blue, but why? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu. You are at Info Vincent McCurry. This is Africa 54. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari is back in West Africa, returning home from a long medical absence in Britain. The 74-year-old leader received treatment at an undisclosed location in London. In his first speech since returning, President Buhari read from a prepared statement in which he vowed to step up the fight against Boko Haram. The government had hoped the president's speech would dampen mounting separatist tensions in the country. The president faces a number of breakaway movements, including the indigenous people of Biafra, led by his fierce critic Namdi Kanu in the country's southeast. This part of the country is dominated by the Igbo ethnic group. I was distressed to notice that some of the comments, especially in the social media, have crossed our national red lines by daring to question our collective existence as a nation. There have been a series of protests in Abuja demanding that Buhari return or quit if he was unable to go on. The rallies turned violent last Tuesday when mainly ethnic Hausa traders pelted protesters with stones. Still in Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari defeated incumbent President Goodluck Jonathan in early 2015 by running on an anti-corruption platform. BOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young discusses with a group of analysts whether Buhari's promised crackdown on bribery and other official malfeasance is producing tangible results. The May 2015 inauguration of Muhammadu Buhari as Nigeria's president marked the first peaceful transfer of executive power in that country. Buhari, who earlier ruled Nigeria from 1983 to 1985 as the head of a military coup, came into office in 2015 as a civilian, pledging to clean up the rampant government corruption that stained predecessor Goodluck Jonathan's administration. Standing in the way of Buhari's anti-corruption pledge is, according to one Nigerian law professor, a culture of compliance. Via Skype from Cape Town Stellenbosch University is Sophie williams Elijbi. The cultural landscape does not allow you to push back on your superior who is doing something that is, you know, that is unethical or, or it's wrong. But President Buhari broke through that tradition of looking the other way, giving new energy to Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and strongly promoting so-called whistleblower laws by which workers can report corrupt government officials. Buhari's efforts, including action against former oil minister Dizani Alison Madueke, are reviewed via Skype from London by watchdog NGO global witness analyst Barnaby Pace. They've seized a lot of assets in Nigeria, including reportedly Alison Madweke's property there and properties allegedly belonging to the former president, Goodluck Jonathan's wife. At the same time, they're trying to prosecute officials like the former attorney general, Mohamed Adoki, who they're trying to extradite from Netherlands to face corruption charges. For Buhari's government and any government to be seen as genuinely fighting corruption, the investigation and prosecution of suspected officials has to be conducted evenly and thoroughly, regardless of political affiliation. Not only to preserve the legitimacy of the effort before the law, but also in the eyes of the Nigerian public. President Buhari's campaign comes up short in this critical aspect, according to former U.S. State Department expert on Nigeria, Matthew Page, via Skype. People close to Buhari, people at senior levels within the, the current ruling party, Buhari's party, have been given a get-out-of-jail-free card, at least for the time being, in terms of, of their past history and their current corrupt dealings um, and uh, and that has uh, disillusioned many Nigerians and opened up Buhari to the criticism that uh, his anti-corruption crusade is 
is somewhat selective in its in its scope. Mr. Page and numerous other Nigeria watchers say the anti-corruption effort takes commitment by lawmakers to pass stronger whistleblower measures and tougher penalties for corruption. Also needed, they say, is a Nigerian judiciary willing to take strong action against those officials caught violating the trust of their office. A successful fight to clean up Nigeria's government needs widespread support. According to, again via Skype, law professor Sophie williams Elijibi. Buhari is trying, but it's not a one-man job. There's a limit to what he can do as a president. The machinery of government, the public, um, you know, the country has to support him and have to believe in, in what he's doing. But there are forces working against reform. On Wednesday, August 16, gunmen in Abuja attacked the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. While there were no casualties, the gunman left a written death threat against EFCC senior investigator Ishaku Sharu. This after another attack against an EFCC investigator in Port Harcourt. Jeffrey Young, VOA News. Zimbabwe's First Lady Grace Mugabe is back home in Harare after being granted diplomatic immunity in South Africa. This comes despite demands that she face prosecution over her alleged assault of 20-year-old model Gabriela Engels in Johannesburg. South African police had previously placed border posts on red alert to prevent Mrs. Mugabe from leaving, but South Africa's international relations minister confirmed Mugabe had been granted diplomatic immunity and she arrived in Harare on Sunday night. Meanwhile, the woman who accuses the First Lady of assault is being given legal assistance by advocacy group AfriForum, led by Harry Neal. He's the prosecutor who secured a murder conviction against Paralympic athlete Oscar Pistorius. Engels accuses Mrs. Mugabe of whipping her with an electric extension cable as she waited with two friends in a luxury hotel suite to meet one of Mugabe's adult sons. Now, churches across Sierra Leone have held special services in memory of the four, more than 450 people killed in mudslides and flooding last week. More than 600 people are still missing. Rescue officials say the chances of finding survivors are decreasing every day. Large-scale barriers have taken place over the last few days amid rain and weather that threatened further mudslides. The government has warned residents to evacuate a mountainside where a crack has opened. Authorities say thousands of people live in areas at risk. Aid workers are providing clean water as health crisis looms. Foreign and uh, from the rest of the world is being sent. Foreign aid from the rest of the world is being sent to Freetown. Meanwhile, the government has cordoned off the disaster site, and officials have started registering people who have been affected so they can receive support from aid organizations. Without safe and legal passage to Europe, more than 100,000 migrants and refugees have made the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean Sea in 2017. Thousands of them cross from Libya, which is a major transit and trafficking hub. In recent months, it has become even more difficult for humanitarian assistance to help those fleeing, as the Libyan Coast Guard has been expanding its operations beyond its territorial waters, often threatening rescue ships belonging to charitable groups. From the United Nations, VOA's Margaret Bashir has more. Humanitarians say the Libyan Coast Guard is intercepting their ships in international waters, then returning African migrants back to war-torn Libya. We have a huge concern about the situation. In Libya, the migrants lack protection and are often detained indefinitely under extremely poor conditions. Detention centers are filthy and overcrowded, and aid workers have no access to them. Libya lacks a single unified government, rival militias operate with impunity, and Islamic State fighters, though weakened, still present a threat in the southern part of the country. This is a country in war. In a country in war, the, there, is, there must be the humanitarian access. So it's, a, it's an imperative, it's a humanitarian imperative. The UN has also urged the Libyan authorities to provide safe, unimpeded aid access. We do have concerns to make sure that uh, all uh, non-governmental organizations and all humanitarian workers are able to go about their work uh, without 
uh, fear and, and without hindrance. Because of the Libyan Coast Guard's threatening posture, several aid organizations, including Doctors Without Borders and Save the Children, have recently suspended their rescue operations. Uh, of course, the consequences of this is that many, many other people will die in the Mediterranean, try to find a, a new life. So far this year, nearly 2,400 people have drowned making the journey. Margaret Bashir, VOA News, the United Nations. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a spectacular sight in the sky. But will, will there be enough viewing lenses available to safely observe the solar eclipse? Stay with us. I'm Jeff Selden, and I work the National Security Beat. National Security Beat is anything that affects the national security of the United States, from counterterrorism to surveillance to even relations with Russia. It's one of the most fascinating beats you can have. It's probably one of the more important beats that you can cover because it touches on so many areas of the world, so many areas of people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm Jeff Selden, and my beat is national security. <laughs> I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. In less than an hour, for the first time in 99 years, the United States will begin to experience a solar eclipse and excitement is building across the nation. Experts advise that people wear specific protective eyewear to view the eclipse. But as VOA's Ken Farabao reports, finding the special lenses was a difficult task. The only thing Sarah McKnight found at the end of a traffic jam that snarled for blocks around Lagunitas Brewery was disappointment. This did not work out for us today at all. McKnight had traveled over 160 kilometers, not for beer, but rather the one thing that is becoming impossible to find anywhere in the Midwest United States. Protective lenses specifically designed to view the total solar eclipse. Literally before we even pulled into the blocks, they were telling us they were gone, they were gone. Totally out. The hottest thing out there right now is this cheap little piece of cardboard with very, very specific lenses that are um, allowing you to, to gaze at the sun, see absolutely nothing other than the sun. Sarah Cole is the vice president of guest experiences at Chicago's Adler Planetarium, which sponsored the Eclipse Glasses giveaway at Lagunitas Brewery. The giveaway was scheduled to start at 12.30 p.m. with 1,000 glasses to hand out for free to those who showed up. Lines began forming at 4 a.m., and because the demand was so overwhelming, the giveaway started early and ended with many people leaving empty-handed. Man is incredibly, incredibly high, and I think that's the understatement of the century. We've gone through immense efforts to try and get as many of these out as possible, and I, I think we couldn't have even anticipated some of the challenges um, with keeping up with the demand that have been there. Right, are you looking for glasses? Yeah, they're all out. The Lagunitas giveaway was the last one sponsored by the Adler before the August 21st eclipse. Cole says they have handed out over 250,000 sets of solar lenses. We thought that a quarter of a million should have us covered given all of the other ways that there would be to get uh, eclipse glasses, but that's been the biggest challenge is that a lot of those other ways of getting eclipse glasses have been compromised. Demand has created a lucrative secondary market for the special lenses, mostly online, which was one of the only ways left, apart from Adler's giveaway events, to get them. All stores are sold out. Uh, yeah, there is, there is very little way to get them at this point. Sold out 
but necessary for eclipse viewing. It is hugely important that people do not look at the sun without this sort of protection. Which means if McKnight can't find a pair of the elusive glasses, she and her boys could miss out on a once in a lifetime opportunity. It feels like the Willy Wonka golden ticket. That's what it feels like. Everyone's like waving around, selling out, no chocolate bars, no chocolate bars. But somehow there was one chalk, there was one golden ticket left, right? And they got it when they least expected it. So somewhere out there, there's some glasses left and we might still find them. The Adler does have some glasses left, reserved for last minute distribution at the planetarium's viewing event on the day of the solar eclipse. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Chicago, Illinois. U.S. President Donald Trump is set to outline the United States' path forward in Afghanistan in a speech on Monday night. His defense secretary, Jim Mattis, says he is satisfied with the process the Trump administration went through to formulate its new strategy. VOA's Marcus Hutton has more. Mattis on Sunday gave reporters no details of any changes to U.S. Afghanistan strategy, saying the specifics will come from President Trump. The president has made a decision, as he said. Uh, he wants to be the one to announce it to the American people, so I'll stand silent until then, uh, until that point. The president met Friday with military and national security advisors to decide how to deal with the 16-year war in Afghanistan. The next day, he tweeted that he had made a decision but said nothing further. The Afghanistan war is the longest in U.S. history. Options under consideration include sending thousands more troops to the country or withdrawing them altogether leaving private contractors to help manage the security situation. Mattis said he was comfortable with the decision-making process. I'm very comfortable that the, that the strategic process was uh, sufficiently rigorous and uh, did not go in with a preset uh, condition in terms of what questions could be asked or what decisions would be made. U.S. military leaders have called the current situation in Afghanistan a stalemate, with the Taliban making advances in Afghanistan and the Pakistan border region. Trump is expected to announce changes to U.S. strategy in coming days. Marcus Harton, VOA News, Washington. The lack of women and diversity in the technology industry remains a headline issue, but the so-called returnship programs are giving companies the chance to tap into a new talent pool of former stay-at-home moms and dads. But how do their skills translate in the tech world? VOA's Tina Trin explains. Employees at the New York tech company AppNexus are a diverse bunch. So diverse, in fact, that some, like Elaine Chang, do not have technology experience. I was a full-time mom for four and a half years. I have two daughters, a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. When it came time to look for work, Chang faced a hurdle many women returning to the workforce experience, explaining the gap in her resume. They often get feedback from companies and recruiters and hiring managers um, that makes them believe that they'll never be hired, that no one will ever overlook their gap. Now, mid-career internships, or returnships as they're called, are giving women and men a shot at entirely new careers, regardless of their previous experience. Path Forward was started inside a tech company and now works with other tech companies to coordinate paid 16-week assignments that can lead to full-time jobs. What these companies of every size in the tech sector have in common is rapid growth um, and also a it, not enough talent to fulfill their needs. Returnships give companies the chance to access a more mature and professionally diverse talent pool. Participants get to try jobs they otherwise wouldn't have known about. A former teacher, Chang sought related positions while being open to new ones. She now works as a product support specialist. I saw them hiring for someone who is passionate about learning and teaching, and I could really relate. I decided to just give it a shot and see what happened. In her role, she's actually spending quite a bit of time with our clients, teaching them about our platform, helping address their issues. We try to educate both the partners 
on how to think about those various skills and experiences, and also women on how to present that in terms that businesses will understand. Cheng admits the career switch has been challenging, but appreciates the opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah. And the most important factor is I have two daughters now and they grow up in a world that is changing so quickly with technology and I just want to be part of that. For this mom, that means taking the path forward, one step at a time. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Why are dogs turning blue in India? We'll answer that in a moment. We are going to reinforce and reinvigorate the fight not only against the elements of Boko Haram. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Photos and videos of blue stray dogs in the Indian township of Navi, Mumbai, have gone viral, triggering angry responses from animal rights groups that say industrial pollutants in a nearby river are responsible. Local media reported on Friday that the Pollution Control Board in India's western region of Maharashtra had threatened to close the company alleged to have released and treated blue dye and powder into the surrounding area near the Kasadi River. Reuters could not independently verify this report. Stray dogs are often seen wading through water in the heat and in the heat searching for water and food in the area. Next up, the British Parliament. The British Parliament's Big Ben Bell sounded the hour for the last time on Monday ahead of being silenced for almost four years of repair work that will deprive London of one of its most iconic sounds. The bell sounded 12 deep bangs at 1100 GMT and will now begin its longest period of silence since it first rang out in 1859. The break will allow workers to carry out much needed maintenance to the Victorian clock and clock tower. The bell is not due to resume regular timekeeping until 2021, though it will be heard on special occasions such as New Year's Eve. And finally, feeling stressed by the strains of modern life, 
a Scandinavian mental wellness company has created a motion tracking meditation app based on Tai Chi. Sway is an interactive meditation app that uses devices in built movement tracking. The idea is to help users find an oasis of calm among the hustle and bustle of modern life. The app focuses on guiding users to make slow, continuous motions with their device. That could be simply moving a smartphone in your hand while sitting down or swaying the device in your pocket. Users are advised to practice interactive meditation for around 20 minutes a day, and that's what's trending today. Now, Danielle Johnson started designing her own clothes when she was a teenager, not just because sewing was her hobby. She wanted to stand out among her classmates with a personal distinctive look. Johnson's vision of fashion motivated her to start her own design company on the wheels. The fashion entrepreneur attracts customers who prefer her rolling retail boutique to big malls and online shopping. Here's VOA's Faith Lapidus. This is the tiny house of fashion, the business Danelle Johnson has always dreamed of having. After graduating from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, Johnson worked in Los Angeles, where fashion trucks are popular. That inspired her to return to her home state, Virginia, and this January, start a mobile fashion business. The theme is we are tiny, but we dream big. Everywhere I go and they see the tiny house, people want to know, what is that? That is so cool. Trying to figure out what it is, and then once they see, oh, wow, and you have a boutique, they automatically think it's amazing. So being mobile, I think, really helps um, and separates myself from a mall location. As amazing as it is, there are challenges, starting with driving to locations around Woodbridge, Virginia. The biggest thing, of course, is pulling a trailer. I've never had to pull a trailer until I decided to do this. Also securing things. When I'm moving and driving down the street, I have to secure all of the clothing, secure the mirror that I also made um, to make sure nothing falls and nothing breaks. Floor-to-ceiling glass windows let in natural light, which helps brighten the small space where Johnson displays her wares. All of the clothes are made in the U.S., so I like to do a lot of research on different um, clothing. I also design clothes, so I'm also going to have local designers um, design for me. So this is our fitting room here. I was on Facebook, and one of my friends had shared the post that she put up about it. And so I was like, well, where is it at? And she said, just Google it, and you'll be able to find out the address anytime that you put it in, because it's always moving. This one is really pretty. Alicia Jones is a return customer. If you look at the clothes, it's not things that you find just by going to a store or anything like that. Um, I see some things online, but you never know how it's going to fit, especially me being short. You know, I wore this skirt. Dominique Ariel Duncan modeled her friend's designs at the Tiny House of Fashion's grand opening fashion show in June and is happy that Johnson's business is doing so well. I think she's already doing a great job with expanding, um, finding different locations to set up. So as long as she keeps doing that, she's on the right track. We are tiny, but we dream big. Danelle Johnson's family and friends show a lot of support. They're spreading the word about the tiny house of fashion by social media and music. For writer Faisal El Masri, I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. And that's our show for today. Good night from Washington. Welcome to English in a Minute. Most people enjoy listening to music. But is this expression actually about songs and tunes? Music to my ears. Jonathan, I cannot believe we have to work over the weekend. Did you not hear the news? The meeting for the project got canceled. No work this weekend after all. Awesome! That is music.